Hey everyone, Alex Demonin here on my first video for my new YouTube channel and I want to talk to you about Photoshop. It's a program I've been using for over 15 years professionally. I want to show you my Photoshop 2020 settings and I'll explain why I have them set that way. This is going to be a great video for somebody who's just starting into Photoshop and doesn't know these settings or somebody who's maybe a photography enthusiast and you're spending a lot of time in the menus and you can't get a flow going. So let's just jump right in. Let's open up Photoshop. This is going to be the first time I've launched this application. So everything's going to be at the default setting because I want to show you guys what things look like right when you open it up and what you can do. So right away, you can see that we're bombarded with all kinds of crap. We want to get rid of this. This is called the welcome screen and it's distracting. There's all kinds of ads and things leading you to do tours. Uh, we just want to get to work when we load up. So let's go ahead and turn that off right away in edit preferences general. We're going to turn off auto show the home screen. Now, the weird thing I found out is that if you click this off, it doesn't save the setting unless you actually open up a file and then close the program with the file still open. It's very strange, but it is. So here we are, we're gonna open up a file. I'm gonna close Photoshop. Now, if I open it back up, there's gonna be no home screen. Look at that. Nice, fresh home screen, no distractions. It's, it's inviting, you just wanna get started to work. The next thing I like to change is actually not possible to change on a PC. It's this big gray background right here. It's called the application frame. And on a Mac, you can go to Window, and it sits right here above Options. I would uncheck the application frame. What it does is it punches a big hole through here, and you can see your background. I find this great because if you have a folder with a couple images you're working on, uh, you're looking at notes that you want to see details or text specs, you can see them while you're working on your file. So why put this big giant gray thing here to block your vision? So I would recommend doing that. It's why I would recommend probably using Photoshop on a Mac if you have the opportunity. Next thing we're going to do is look into our, our actual Photoshop settings on how the program works. So let's start again in general. Let's take a look at what a new document looks like right now. File, file, new. Got this giant screen, all of these tabs. I get, it looks like the welcome screen all over again. This is just way too big. Let's close this. References, general. Turn on legacy new document, see what that looks like. This is much nicer. Just want to put in the name, size of the file, color space, and you're done. None of that extra stuff. Next, we're going to go to performance. This is a really important one. The default is 70%. I like it around 90%. And the reason is, if I'm working in Photoshop, I have some music running, and I have the operating system running, and that's about it. I don't need anything else taking up resources. So let's give all the resources to Photoshop. Give it all of the RAM that you purchased. Let it do its thing. The next thing I like to change is the history states. I find 50 a little too low. I find 100 a nice sweet spot. It goes all the way up to 1,000, but if you're doing 1,000 edits and then you have to go back 900, you're probably making a huge mistake somewhere along the line uh, that is not going to be fixed by history states. Also, this takes up a ton of RAM and memory, which you don't want it to suck up. You want to keep it a nice small size. The next setting is scratch disk. If you have multiple hard drives, set it to your fastest hard drive with the most space. Uh, so C drive is my SSD and it's got plenty of space. Funny story, I tried to open up Photoshop on my laptop this morning. It had five gigabytes. Photoshop would not even open. Another story, if you have a file open and it's very large and you happen to just go over the threshold of your computer, it actually won't let you save your file because you do not have enough memory in the scratch disk. So I find having at least 10 gigabytes before you start working uh, a good sweet spot that will get you out of trouble. But try to keep that fast and very large. That's it for preferences. The next thing we're going to go into is keyboard shortcuts. 
This is the flow that I was talking about in the introduction, that if you are going into these menus and clicking on things a lot with your mouse and moving to find actions, you're, you're taking up too much time and you're taking yourself out of the flow of the work. You want these things to be shortcuts so that they're easily accessible and you just get into this rhythm of working and keep your mind on the work and what you're gonna do next. If your mind is thinking about the settings, then you're not gonna get this artistic mode that a lot of people get into called the zone. So the first setting I like to change is in image. And it's the selective color. This is my favorite color adjustment tool. You will do so much color adjustment, especially on enthusiast photography. I like to set this to an F key that's not used. Try F12 or F13 or print screen, something like that. Don't worry if it overwrites something. You will never use file revert, I promise. Except, okay. The next setting I like is in select color range. Color range is my favorite way to create a selection so that you can go use selective color. So we want this to be very easy and accessible at all times. So I wanna accept that. The last setting I like to change is inverse. If you're making a lot of color range selections, so you're gonna inverse the selection a lot to get the opposite result. I like it to be control I. Control I is image adjustment invert, which means if you have a black image, it's gonna make it white. You're rarely gonna use that. You're gonna be using inverse selection a hundred times more, I promise you. So keep that as control I. You don't want three button shortcuts because then your hand is doing all these contortion movements and your hand's gonna hurt after doing it repetitively for years. Keep it as two maximum. I prefer legacy undo and I'll explain why. As it is set right now, every time you press control Z, it'll continue to go back in history. And I'll tell you why I don't like this. Because when you're making an edit that you want to review with yourself or an art director, you want to go back and forth very quickly to see what, what you just did. And I'll show you an example of that. Let's turn on legacy undo. I've already had it set. Open up a file. Do a couple edits. Move it. Change its color. So I've got a couple history states. So by default, Control Z would continue to jump back in these states. But I just want to see the last edit that I did so that I can review how successful it was. So every time I click Control Z, I'm seeing the color change. And this lets me know that this is where I was and this is how far I went with just two clicks. Actually, it's just one click. My finger is holding down Control and I'm just pressing Z over and over to see the change. Okay, that's it for shortcuts. The last thing we're going to look at today is the panels. Look, look how much real estate these panels are taking up on our screen. If you're just starting out, get rid of everything. Just kill it all. Start from scratch and we'll build you up a nice layers panel setup. Boom, all gone. Let's go to window. First thing we want is actions. You're gonna be making a lot of cool actions to speed up your workflow. Just keep this floating for now. Next thing we want is channels. Channels are a nice way to save your color range selections for a later time if you need it, but I usually keep it more hidden. Next thing is history. In case you wanna go back a stage, uh, it works great with the history brush. I use that a lot, it's a great technique. Next would be info panel, something I like handy, but I like to keep hidden. It shows you the, the color format you're in. You can look at total ink when you're outputting your final files. Layers is ultra important paths for making those really, really precise selections that color range can't get. You have to do them manually with a path. And the properties panel. This one comes up by default anyway. As you're using curves and levels, it just pops itself up to show you what the settings are. So we got these jumble of panels now. Let's put them in a nice order. So channels and layers work well together. 
paths I like right underneath. Actions I like on top because they usually precede a, a layer or the work I'm doing on them. Info I like beside history. Properties I like above layers but kept hidden since it's not always active. And history and info I like to attach right to the side here and keep it hidden. But don't group them together. You want it just underneath it like that with that separation. And there you go. Doesn't that look so much better? You got more real estate. You have only what you need. You won't use half of these settings. These are the core ones you're going to be using more than half of the time. Hey, thanks for watching. If you got some value out of this video, please like and subscribe to this channel. It lets me know I'm headed in the right direction. And I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Thanks.